Okay, guys. So um, let's maybe start warming up, um, getting a few more ideas together. So if you think about what we were trying to do, we wanted to calculate the force that a charged particle would feel. We said that calculating the force that a charged particle would feel amounted to calculating the electric field that would be set up by the source. And in actual fact, we've already done that. There is the electric field set up by the source, and there is the electric field set up by the source. So that original, very general question that we wanted to ask, we have already answered. You tell me some distribution of charges, and I will simply add up the electric field to each charge. That gives me the total electric field, and I know exactly what force is acting my probe. I just multiply by the charge of the probe. You give me a continuous charge distribution, and I'll do this integral. And then I know exactly what the electric field is. Again, I'll just multiply by the charge of the probe. I know exactly what force is acting on my probe. So I have answered the question that I initially wanted to answer. <coughs> However, we can ask ourselves, how good is this answer? And to be honest, this answer is not very good. So, um, as you were mentioning, you know, can we always calculate this integral? No. Many times we cannot, and we have to do it numerically. And if you're considering a very complicated charge distribution, or very, very many charges, in fact, it can be numerically very expensive to calculate either that sum or that integral. Um, I had one PhD student in electrical engineering, and what he was doing is he was calculating the electric and magnetic fields around a plane. And they were doing it so that they could model very accurately the communication system of the plane. So there was some company that built planes and they asked our university, can you model the electric and magnetic fields around the plane? And what you had to do, you had to evaluate these kinds of integrals and things similar to that. I can tell you that he would start a program running on a supercomputer and two months later we would get an answer. <laughs> So actually, when you have this answer written in terms of an integral and a sum, sometimes that's not the most useful way of expressing the answer. So what we would like to do now, even though we've answered our original question, we want to try to develop some better ways of thinking about the electric field. And in fact, we're going to write down some equations, and what those equations will describe is the geometry of the field lines of the electric field. So we're now going to you know, think about the electric field, develop another description that's got a bit more physics in it and a bit more insight into it. So to do that, we're going to need a little bit of, uh, of mathematics. Um, so the math that we will need, we're going to start studying this operator. So it's called nabla. It is x hat and a partial derivative with respect to x plus y hat, a partial derivative with respect to y, plus z hat, and a partial derivative with respect to z. It is a vector. It's got an x hat, a y hat, and a z hat component. But at the same time, it's also an operator. It acts by differentiating functions. So it's both a vector and an operator. What kinds of things can you do with a vector? I can multiply a vector with a scalar, right? So one of the things I should expect I can do, I can take my nabla and I can act on a scalar field. That's one of the things I should be able to do. If I've got two vectors, what can I do with them? Take a dot product or cross product. So I should be able to take a vector field and take a dot product with the vector field, I should be able to take a cross product with a vector field. So these are natural things, knowing that it's a vector, these are natural things that I should try to do uh, with my new object nabla. So this is what we're going to explore today. And we're going to specifically explore this one, which is called the divergence. Of 
V, and I think today we'll also start to explore this one, which is called the curl of V. Okay, now I would like to draw some pictures. Uh, so first of all, let's take V1 and let's imagine that it's the following vector field. So V1 is equal to x, x hat plus y, y hat. So I'm imagining it doesn't point in the z direction and it doesn't depend on the z direction. Okay? And this is just for simplicity. It's going gonna, it's gonna to mean that we land up working in two dimensions where we can really visualize things. So I'm just going to pick some value for z. It doesn't matter what value. So this picture that I'm drawing has all the same value for z. You might say z is naught. So this is a picture of z is naught. What does vary on this plane is x and y. So points on this plane are given by an x, y value. They all have z as naught. We have x hat pointing that way and y hat pointing that way. Now what I would like to do, I want to draw v1. So I'll go to this point here. Okay. So at this point here, x is 1. If x, x is 1 and y is 0. If I plug in x is 1 and y is 0, what is v1? x hat. So I will just get a vector here pointing in the x hat direction with a length of 1. If I go to this point, here x is 2 and y is? So what is v1? 2 x hat. Here I have y is 1. What does the vector field look like? y is 1, x is? v1 is? Over here, 2 y hat. What about over here? What will the field look like here? Here? Good. So that's what it looks like. Here it will point out like that. Here it will point out like that. Point out like that. So that's the picture of V1. I want you guys now to draw the picture for V2. And let's take V2 to be um, y times x hat minus x times y hat. So I want you guys to plot that vector field on your page. Okay, can anyone tell me what the field looks like at this point? X is 1. 
Which way does it point? Up? At x is one, it points? Down. Because there's a y is 0. x is 1, so it's minus y hat. Good. Down. What about here? Y is? No, Y is? Minus 1. X is? What is X? X is 0. Y is? It's minus X hat. Yeah? X is up. <coughs> and if you go here, they get bigger, but the direction is the same. And then even bigger. But the direction is the same. Okay. Yeah, that's circling around. And that's exactly the right intuition to take. You might think of each of these arrows as the velocities of some particles that are moving. Okay? And here, what are the particles doing? They're spinning around, right? Here, what are the particles doing? They're spreading out. Good. Very good. So here the particles are spreading. There, they are circling. Okay. Diverge is an English word. Can someone tell me what does diverge mean? Me and my friend, we took paths that diverged. What does that mean? My path went this way and his path went that way. That's what it means to diverge. Okay? Good. Now, let's calculate the divergence of V1. So let's do this first one in detail and we'll see it's just the usual rules of using vectors. So for now that we know it's x hat d by dx plus y hat d by dy plus z hat d by dz dotted into x x hat plus y y hat. Now, when I do this multiplication, I multiply as usual. So I need to say this into that, plus this into that, and the next term. This into that, that into that. So the usual distributive property. When I multiply, there's two things going on. There's one piece which is the vectors, and I'm told with the vectors I should take the dot product. And then I have the derivative acting. So the first thing that I'm going to do is multiply the vectors using the dot product. So I have x hat dotted into x hat. What does that give me? 1. Then I have d by dx acting on x. What does that give me? 1. 1 times 1 is? You guys are great. <laughs> so that's the first term. 1. Plus x hat dot y hat. Plus y hat dot x hat plus y hat dot y hat d by dy times y don't be too eager one one times one plus z hat dot x hat z hat dot y hat 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0 plus 0. Great. 2. So that's what we got. The divergence of this field is 2. Okay? I want you guys to work out now on your page. What is the divergence of V2? Do it. <laughs>
Okay, guys, what did you get for the divergence of V2? Zero. zero. Good. Everyone get zero? Yes. Good. Divergence of V2 is zero. That's perfect. Now, look at this. In this situation, the particles really are moving away from each other. The divergence is positive. In this situation, the particles are not moving away from each other. They're just circulating around. The divergence is zero. What would happen if the divergence is negative? The particles are moving towards each other. So when you calculate the divergence, you learn about the particles, or you can think about the electric field lines. This will hold for the electric field lines too. You learn, are the electric field lines moving away from each other? Are they coming towards each other? Or are they just circulating around? So by calculating the divergence of the electric field, we're able to now start making statements about the geometry of the electric field lines. And we want to write down a set of equations for the geometry of the field lines that will determine the field lines completely. And one of the things that we will use is the divergence of the electric field. Good. Now, in fact, uh, you've got a nice intuitive picture of the divergence, and the picture that you've got is the correct one. But it's a little bit more subtle than what I've said here. So let's now take a look at divergence and develop it so that you've really got the full story. So this picture, keep in your minds, this is the right picture to have. But it's a little bit more subtle and let me explain why. <coughs> um, I again want to consider two um, electric fields, or two vector fields, and I again want you to calculate the divergence. But the vector fields that I want to consider now are the following. Let's maybe call one of them U1. And let's say it is equal to x times by x hat. Okay? No y hat component, just an x component. So if we want to draw u, okay, on this line over here, what does u look like? It's just the zero vector, everyone agree? Because on this line over here, x is naught. On this line over here, where x is 1, what does the vector field look like? Length 1. On this line over here, where the vector field is 2, what does the vector field look like? Length 2. And now, I want you to think uh, about the following. Imagine that these lines tell us the speed of some water particles. So those are the velocities of water. So there's some water going past. And I'm going to put a screen here. So here is a screen. And I want you to measure how much water goes past the screen. So think about how much water goes past. You've got the velocity of all of these water particles. They're not moving that fast at each point past the screen. That's how fast the water's moving. Now look at this point. The water's moving much faster past this screen. Do you agree? So between this screen and this screen, there must be some water that's being added to the system. If you measure the amount of water going past this screen, the particles are moving with a speed of 1 meter per second. If you measure the amount of water passing through past this screen, the particles are moving with a speed of 2 meters per second. So over here, you know, the river's flowing quite slowly. Over here, the river's flowing twice as fast. In between these two points, there must be some water that you're putting into the system. Because there's more water flowing past this point, where the water's flowing twice as fast as it is past this point, where the water's flowing more slowly. Is everybody happy with that? 
Anyone who's not happy would like me to say it again. I'll happily say it again if you want me to. Good. Is there no other condition that can lead the water to run faster apart from the water? No. Like slope. Like what? Slope. Okay, so if there was slope, then when the water ran faster, you would see that the, the, the river has to get thinner. Because if you are, if there's the same amount of water flowing, but each particle is moving faster, it means the area that the water is flowing through must have decreased. In this situation, in the z direction, nothing changes because nothing depends on z. So imagine here on this wall, everywhere on that wall, there's water flowing with velocity v. And then everywhere on this wall, there is water flowing with velocity 2v at every point. Past this wall, if you want to get the amount of water that's flowing, you need to take that area and multiply it by the volume. For that wall, you need to take that area. Uh, sorry, you need to take this area and multiply it by the velocity that the water is flowing at. For that wall, you'll take that area and multiply it by the velocity. And because the water is passing that wall slower than it is passing this wall, there must be more water flowing here than there is flowing past there. Happy with that? Good. Happy? Good. Slightly unhappy when I just think of the dimensions. Area times velocity gives you volume per second. So the volume here, the volume there, the volume per second here is more than you need to have. Exactly. Yep. <clears throat> now, what that means is in the middle here, there must be more water particles being injected into the system. Does everyone agree? So there's more water being put in. Now, I want you guys to calculate. I want to know what is the divergence of U1? One? Good. The divergence of U1 is 1. See, you guys only started doing divergences 10 minutes ago. And now you're already doing them in your heads. That's great. The divergence is one, and yet it doesn't look like the particles are moving away from each other, right? They're all moving next to each other. What this divergence is actually measuring is how much extra particles are being put into the system. And here, at each point, we're putting in the same number of particles. So it's telling us about the source where the particles are coming from, the source of, of the field. So it could be the source of the water particles. You know, there's a tap that's putting water into the system. Let's do another one. Let's now say that U2 is equal to x hat. In this case, the field looks the same everywhere. So if we look at any particular screen here, the amount of water passing each screen is exactly the same. Does everyone agree? Because the speed is the same. How many particles are being added to this system? None. What's the divergence of U2? Zero. Zero. Absolutely. Good. That's it. That's the complete story of the divergence. So the right intuitive picture is that the field lines move away from each other, but what it's actually telling you is, what is the source of that field? Can you guys tell me what is the source of the electric field? <coughs> charge. It's charge that sets up the electric field. Everyone agree? What we're going to learn is that one of Maxwell's equations says the divergence of the electric field on this side you will expect charge. It actually turns out to be charge density over epsilon naught, a constant. So that's one of the equations that we're going to get. And you can see this looks very natural because the charge is the source for the electric field. OK? Good. So that's divergence. Any questions on divergence?
Good.